All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the RCA's 32nd annual conference. Uh, I'd like everyone to take a look around, look around this room, look left, look right. Uh, what you're seeing is kind of historic. Uh, after 32 years, we have 375 people attending this conference, the largest conference ever. So that's awesome. <laughs> Now, I'm told, because there's 375 people, that some of you are intense. <laughs> I, I, I bet those, one, those people are no longer going to procrastinate in booking their hotel room, right? <laughs> I, I also, uh, to start off this conference, I get to announce the successful candidates of newly elected directors for the RCA. I hope you're in the room. <laughs> Returning to us, we have Pamela Haggerty and Mikhail Matero. And newly joining us, we have Jeannie Bertrand, <laughs> Ursula Acuna Kuken, oh, I'm not going to do it, Kuken, Kukenbacker. <laughs> and finally, Christy Lyon. So welcome, I look forward to working with you and your job is to make me cry at the next AGM, just say it. All right, on a serious note, uh, the title for this conference is Sea Change. And you may not know this, because I didn't know it until Christina handed me a link and said you better look at this, uh, that Sea Change is a reference from Shakespeare's The Tempest. Uh, Shakespeare's quote, um, full fathom five, thy father lies, nothing of him doth fade but doth suffer a sea change. And over the years, that meaning has changed from a literal definition uh, to, one, um, to a figurative definition. And Miriam's dictionary now defines it as a marked, marked, transforma sorry, a marked change or transformation, especially in public policy. And that is certainly where we are right now in the recycling world, isn't it? A sea change. We're at an apex, a crux a point in time, where we can't go back from where we were blindly believing that all recycling is better than no recycling. We know now that it's better to landfill than to wish cycle uh, and to send materials overseas to countries and companies that can't handle the material. We can't go back to those innocent days and we are in fact in the midst of a massive sea change in our line of work. Where credibility is on the line and our activities are under scrutiny. Where accountability matters more than more than now than ever, and it is a transformation from the raw egg to the fried egg. You can't unfry the egg. So our industry now is forever changed, but in the best possible way. Uh, we are in a sea change, and I, for one, am celebrating it. So bring it on. Uh, so over this conference, I challenge you to listen, to ask questions, to shake up your status quo, and to undergo your own personal sea change. Meet someone new. Sit with someone new at lunch you've never sat before. Learn something new and spread the news about what you've learned when you leave. Be an ambassador for the sea change. And with that, I will call the 32nd RCA annual conference to a start. And I'm going to clap for myself. Here. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> and to also kick off this conference, it's my pleasure to introduce Karen Ronco from Alberta Environment and Parks. Karen took on the role of Executive Director of the Land Policy Branch within Environment and Parks just over a year ago. The branch has a broad scope of files leading the development of integrated policies for public lands, recycling, reclamation, rangelands, and brownfields. Karen has, an extensive, has extensive leadership experience within the government of Alberta, and these include areas of water policy, small business and entrepreneurship, municipal government, along with industry, community, and economic development. She holds the degree of agriculture from the University of Alberta, a diploma in urban land economics, and a certificate in real property assessment from, both, from the University of British Columbia. In her spare time, Karen is a proud and enthusiastic supporter of youth basketball and has spent a number of seasons coaching. She and her husband live in Sherwood Park with her daughter and the true rulers of their house, their cats. I can relate to that. <laughs> Given the opportunity, she likes reading and gardening and swimming and has recently attempted, in quotes, to take up running, I can also relate to that, uh, and is a self-professed uh, Star Trek nerd, but she would like to acknowledge that Harry Potter runs a very close second. So with that, I will welcome Karen Ronco to the stage. Okay, so. 
So good morning. This is going to be a test for those of us who have bifocals because I've got lights there, it's dark here, and I've got a room over there. So anyway, thank you very much, and thank you very much, Jody, for that kind welcome. I have to say I always very much enjoy getting out of the office and being able to come out to events or meetings or you know, small gatherings of people on certain topics because it gives me a chance to get rid of that noise. You know, you know if you are in a busy office, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You get to put aside the noise and be able to really listen and concentrate and be able to get to, to down to some of the grassroots issues. So that's what I really am looking forward to being able to do today. This conference is important, uh, as I tell, uh, I have a number of areas of focus, as Jody had talked about, so when I'm out with the rangeland folks, I tell them they're my favorite file, and so today I'm going to tell you, and this is the truth, the, the, the waste and recycling is my favorite favorite file. It is fascinating. If you would have talked to me a year ago and said I would be absolutely fascinated by the life cycle of a pop bottle, recycling, plastic and paper waste and all of those sorts of things, um, I would probably have said, well, okay, that's nice. But it is really a fascinating topic. This conference is important not just because it gets me out of the office and gets me a chance to come and learn some new things, but it's also an opportunity to recognize the work that RCA has done over the years and be able to bring together industry, municipalities, concerned uh, stakeholder groups, all under one roof to get those different perspectives. Um, in my role with Environment and Parks, I really do appreciate the hard work undertaken by RCA and its members to pr promote resource conservation, waste reduction and recycling, as well as the edu edu education and advocacy. It's amazing to see how far not only RCA has come, but also society in general on this recycling and reuse and thinking about how to use things in different ways not to promote any one uh, um, organization, but I happened to be in a retailer recently and they proudly had recycled polyester for a heading on one of their blouses or recycled wool within their coats. And if you think about it, in 1987, you wouldn't have seen that. So in some of my research, uh, when I come out and talk or when I give you know, an opening or greetings or something like this, I like to do a little bit of research. You know, what year was the organization founded? What was happening back that year when things were founded? So I did the uh, way back in time machine for a moment and I got the Google box out and put in the following phrases, 1987, waste, Alberta, and recycling. So, and here is a sampling of what came up. And so, first of all, I'm not going to, um, please forgive me, I'm not picking on any one municipality here. Um, 1987, the city of Edmonton hosted its first household hazardous waste roundup. Big thing in the front of the Edmonton Journal. And keep in mind this was done prior to curbside recycling. Curbside recycling didn't come in for the city of Edmonton until 1988, I found out. And see if this little tale sounds at all familiar. Um, there are officials, and this is back 1987 again, officials in New York were seeing their landfill space running out on Long Island. They decided to try something new. Uh, paying a private carting consortium to ship via barge trash to North Carolina, uh, to a North Carolina dump for a fraction of what it would cost to dispose of it in uh, the Northeast United States, Northeastern United States. But the North Carolina residents wanted nothing to do with the garbage barge uh, coming their way, so the ship, the Mobro 4000, wandered the seas for two months, all the way to Belize and back, before the trash was burned in Brooklyn and the ash put back in the dump where it had originated from. <laughs> and then the third one I'll just draw your attention to, a well-known fast food chain that might have a big yellow M in front of it, began alternatives to the, remember those really thick foam packages? Yeah, that was the year they got rid of those foam packages. 
So these examples are not only an interesting look back in time, but very illustrative of that sea change that Jody was talking about. How far uh, waste reduction and waste management have come since 1987, but also a really illustrative of, you know, things change, but things remain the same, and we do have an opportunity in front of us uh, as leaders in all of our organizations to see where we can go, what can we do, what incremental piece can we take on. In my portfolio, we are well aware of the current recycling um, issues, both that RCA and our other stakeholder groups have brought to our, ourselves. Um, and there are you know, lots of, of uh, advocacy and lots of information that have been passed to us, and we really do appreciate that and ask that to continue. We also take the concerns very seriously and continue to welcome all the thoughts and information that has been coming our way so that we can create some meaningful solutions for Albertans, not only for today, but for tomorrow. And as Jody had said, I encourage you all here today to, to uh, use this conference as an opportunity to exchange ideas, learn from one another, and make contacts. Um, and I thank you uh, for, for the RCA to be able to uh, come up here and, and, and spend some time with you today and meet and be able to address you this morning. And uh, most importantly, I thank the volunteers. These sorts of events don't just happen with a little pixie dust and good, goodwill. The volunteers are very important and nothing happens without a successful volunteer component. So I wish you good conversations, and I challenge you as one of the folks I had worked for very early on in my career had challenged me. It's a poor day if you can't learn at least three new things each day. So I'll leave you with that challenge, and I wish you safe travels to wherever uh, you go after this conference or on your way home. So thank you. Good morning. My name is Leah Seabrook. I'm with Strathcona County. I'm going to be opening up the first session. If I could have Ruben and Usman come on up to uh, have a seat. Pick a chair, any chair. You could actually slide that. So, welcome to Riptide, the first uh, session of the day. Um, like Jody spoke to the conference theme, Sea Change, I've also drawn a little bit of a comparison for this morning's session. So, riptides are powerful currents that pull away from shore, and if you've ever been caught up in one, they are quite unpredictable, very tumultuous, and uh, quite scary, which sounds quite familiar to what we're experiencing in the waste industry today. So, and as opposed to a flash rip that kind of comes and goes, things we've experienced in the past, this one seems to be a bit of an, a permanent riptide. And the new norm. So we need to learn how to navigate these new waters. And so I did a bit of Googling, how do you survive if you get caught in a riptide? Because if we could Google how to fix the waste industry, that would be way too easy. So Google tells me, don't panic. It's gonna be overwhelming and terrifying for a while, but stay calm. Fighting it will only exhaust you and deflate you, which I think we've all had those feelings over the last year. Stay afloat, tread water, you know, carefully navigate the chaos, and then go with the flow and ask for some help. So again, sounds a bit relevant to uh, our times today. So this leads me to our speakers. We have a powerhouse trio with us here today. Our, our third speaker will be Skyping in a little bit later. And they're here to help us guide us to calmer waters and to help our cries for help and, and, and uh, provide some solutions. So with that, let me introduce our first speaker, Ruben Anderson. Uh, Ruben Anderson consults on behavior change, sustainability, and regenerative systems. He's trained as a product designer. He brings the perspective of someone who has worked in the global mass manufacturing system. 
While working with the City of Vancouver, Ruben advised on future-proofed, locally resilient systems and supervised a zero-waste proposal for the 2010 Winter Olympics. He, he has taught sustainable design at the Emily Carr University and is an acclaimed cradle-to-cradle -cradle product designer. While researching pro-environmental behavior change for Metro Vancouver, one of his pilot projects saw a 250% increase in garbage diverted to recycling and composting. He now works for Fernwood Neighborhood Resource Group, a social enterprise in Victoria, BC. And perhaps over a beer tonight at the reception. Are you staying for the reception? Yes, yeah. He will tell you about the time he forged a knife with a Japanese sword maker and how he excels at swinging from a trapeze. So very interesting. So please join me in welcoming Ruben. Good morning, everybody. Get all my stuff. Okay, thank you all for coming this morning and listening to me. And thanks especially to Christina Seidel. She's seen me talk a couple times before. She almost saw me run out of town after one of my talks. So she brought me to Jasper where it's uh, surrounded by mountains and there's nowhere to run. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna explain what compassionate systems are today and I'm gonna talk a lot about behavior change. But first I'm going to explain why everything you're doing is wrong, why even your hopes and dreams are doomed to fail, and why your children are angry. Uh, but first, just a bit about myself. I live in Victoria, BC, which is the territory of the Lekwungen-speaking peoples, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. I got a degree in industrial design, which is design for mass production. I wanted to design durable, beautiful, sustainable products out of recycled materials, heirlooms heirloom stuff. Um, and then I promptly got a job making crap in China. Uh, we lived in a hotel in Shenzhen and visited factories that are manufacturing garbage at a massive scale. So here's a picture from one of these factories. Uh, just one of their many product lines is recirculating water fountains. These are totally unrecyclable and they made hundreds of thousands of them in uh, hundreds of products, hundreds of different product lines. Uh, so I designed uh, a very small part of the junk that's coming back to haunt our landfills. I didn't design a fountain, but uh, lots of picture frames and lamps and jewelry boxes. I once opened up a photo album in the uh, gift shop of the uh, museum, the Art Gallery of Vancouver, and I was surprised to find that I designed it. So that's the prototype there. I think that may be the world's first pop-up photo album. What an accomplishment. So. That was very interesting work, but it was hard to get out of bed in the morning to go kill the planet. So I, uh, this all got me interested in consumerism and human behavior, and I ended up working in the City of Vancouver Sustainability Group. After that, I worked with the Regional District, Metro Vancouver, where I researched behavior change and tested pilot projects on pro-environmental behavior like recycling and water conservation. Uh, I actually worked on the first pilots of food scraps recycling and on the regional rollout for the food scraps program. Uh, and as Leah said, at one of our multifamily test sites, the recycling rate went up 250%. So that was a huge success. Uh, and by the way, I would love to talk about multifamily if anybody wants to later, because I think the narrative about multifamily is totally wrong. Uh, before I spend too much time talking about behavior, let me define what behavior is. This is from Wikipedia, I actually quite like this. Behavior is the response of the system or organism to various stimuli or inputs, whether internal or external, conscious or subconscious, overt or covert, and voluntary or involuntary. So everything is behavior, and we want to change behavior. We want people to behave in a different way. Sometimes it's us, sometimes it's our kids, sometimes it's uh, our society, sometimes it's just one person in a position of power. But we want change, and that means that some or all of us will have to behave differently. So, what causes behavior change? The most common story we tell is that behavior is driven by education. Education provides us with new information. We analyze the information and that changes our values. And based on these new values, we choose new behavior. Think, choose, act. This is also a theory of change. 
So this is a hypothesis of how we think change happens. So the th if the theory of change is correct, uh, we should be able to educate people and then they'll behave differently. Uh, and this theory is incredibly easy to disprove. <laughs> uh, lack of education is seldom the problem, it's a myth. Several years ago, I put together my top 10 myths of behavior change. This is uh, what I heard on the street. This is what I heard in focus groups and surveys. Uh, this is how we tell the story of why other people are not doing what we think they should do. People are lazy. People don't care. It's all about education. People won't change until you hit them in the wallet. It's all about carrots and sticks. The system works. It's the people that are the problem. Immigrants don't care. It's all about convenience. Regulation is the only way to change things, and for business, it's all about the bottom line. So these myths present a slightly different theory of change, so let me group them a bit. So it's all about education, and therefore, when education does not result in change behavior, that must mean that people are stupid, lazy, uncaring, immoral, and possibly even foreign. <laughs> and therefore, <laughs> Since uh, people are lazy and stupid and uncaring, you must use carrots and sticks to change their behavior. So this theory of change is more like won't learn, won't act, must be bribed and beaten. <laughs> so we've taken our definition of behavior and crossed out all of this and replaced it with education. And then when this doesn't work, we scribble through the whole thing and say behavior is a response to being bribed and beaten. So this is bananas. And there are decades of research that contradict this. The most important comes from Daniel Kahneman, who's famous for writing Thinking Fast and Slow. Kahneman says we have evolved two cognitive systems. So system one is fast, intuitive, and emotional, and system two is slow and rational. Another popularizer of this work is Jonathan Haidt, who tries to give some scale to system one and system two with the metaphor of a big, strong elephant uh, with a rational rider in charge. Uh, except to be accurate, the elephant should be 10 times larger and as fast as a racehorse, and uh, it's often the one in charge, not the rider. So other than those three fundamental flaws to the metaphor, it's uh, useful. But, but why two systems? Why doesn't education work? Why don't we just think carefully about everything like the rational people we tell ourselves we are? Uh, so to understand this, I wanna spend a couple of minutes looking at the evolution of the brain. So here's a chart of skull volume showing our hominid ancestors. So you can see that four million years ago, we had a tiny little brain. There's a lot of speculation why our brain started growing, but uh, one of the main guesses is that we started eating lots of good Alberta beef, and that, uh, <laughs> along with cooking with fire, uh, the dense calories and nutrients enabled our brain to grow. But to help understand behavior, we need to put this chart in a little more context. So here's 500 million years. Half a billion years ago, uh, the reptilian brain evolved. So this is really just kind of a fat bump on our spinal cord. This is what keeps us breathing. It keeps our heart beating. It regulates our body temperature. Just the very basic stuff of life. 360 million years ago, fishes walked out on land, and the first mammals appeared about 200 million years ago. So in these mammals, the reptilian brain grew in some areas, and it developed a limbic system. So this is system one, this is the elephant. It's often called the emotional brain, and this is not where we do conscious, future-oriented, rational planning. Uh, now, you know why they do medical experiments on mice? It's because 80 million years ago, we had a common ancestor. So 80 million years ago, we were mice. <laughs> uh, and we still share quite a bit of DNA with mice. So 120 million years after our limbic system evolved, we were still mice. And it took another 76 million years to get to this uh, small-brained ancestor, and maybe a couple more million years to use fire and start getting lots of dense nutrients that allow us to really grow a big brain. We've only been modern humans, homo sapiens, for 40,000 years. <laughs> so our brain looks at some kind of recycling and it's like, nah, I've been doing this for 200 million years. I'm not gonna change now. <laughs> so uh, our brain evolved to deal with a lion attack, not with a blue box. The last part of our brain to evolve <clears throat> is the prefrontal cortex. 
So this is where conscious thought about planning and decision making occurs. This is the rider. It's very energy hungry. Uh, your brain uses about 20% of the energy that you eat. Dr. Roy Baumeister has researched will, willpower and decision making and uh, he's found our prefrontal cortex can only get enough glucose for a few hours of conscious thought each day. Uh, Baumeister finds that whenever we have to think about something or make a decision of any kind, it depletes our capacity for future decision making. So the more decisions we have to make in a short period of time, the worse our decisions become. So here's Baumeister with all these cupcakes. Uh, he's done a bunch of research where he asked people if they would like a sweet or a healthy snack. Uh, and the people that say no to the sweet go on to make bad decisions and tests. They used up their brain energy. Uh, they used it up on impulse control, resisting the urge to eat cake. So you stick to your diet, and then you make a bunch of bad choices afterwards. <laughs> So Baumeister shows that uh, how we think about behavior is quite wrong. Our brains really are like a muscle. So a thought is actually a physical connection between hundreds of thousands of neurons. And our brains can be exhausted. So we can only run so far, we can only jump so high, and we can only think so much. This is the physical reason why we have evolved the two cognitive systems that Kahneman has researched. Thoughts are not effortless, like a wisp of smoke just floating through our head. Thoughts are very effortful, like running a marathon. And just like our muscles, our brain needs food to do its work. This study looked at parole rates. They found that parole rates were highest after meal times. So the judge has a snack and a little rest, and parole rates jump up. And the unlucky person who gets a parole hearing right before lunch goes back to jail. Uh, now, just a small tangent, I said uh, part of my talk title could be why your children are angry. Nobody has any expectations for babies. They eat and sleep and cry. But when they're toddlers, we start getting a little more angry when they don't behave properly. Uh, by the time they are teenagers, we have very little patience left. Uh, but here's the thing. The prefrontal cortex does not finish growing until about age 25. So you look at your teenagers, maybe they're even taller than you. Uh, they're articulate, they're learning really fast, but inside the body of that young adult is still a, a, a not very developed brain. They literally do not have impulse control. They literally cannot plan into the future. And so when you get angry at them <laughs> for being stupid teenagers, they are just doing the best they can. They're doing the best they can with a very powerful emotional brain and a very weak and still growing rational brain. Uh, on the other end of life, some of you may have parents with dementia. Again, conflict is created by expectations that are greater than their cognitive capacity can handle. So we have this 200 million year old, emotional, intuitive, subconscious, social, and responsive brain that we use most of the time to save energy whenever possible. And then we have the much newer, very energy hungry, rational system that we use only when it's absolutely necessary. Now this matters because almost everything we try to do to change behavior is very energy intensive. We ask people to remember to turn things on or off. We ask people to educate themselves, to post, to tweet. We need them to focus their attention so that they can sort recycling properly and take shorter showers and ride their bike. In the typical approach, we want you to pay attention. So look at the words, it says it right there. Attention comes at a cost, it's expensive. There's a price that must be paid. And when you spend your attention on something, you have less attention to spend on something else. So you're listening to me right now. I'm draining your brain, and your afternoon is going to be shot. <laughs> so our brain knows there's a price to be paid. Uh, and it's actually quite defensive about its resources. So you know how you get that feeling that someone isn't listening to you? They probably just aren't listening to you. Is it because they're a jerk, or because they don't like you, or they think you're stupid? Or is it because they've used up their attention span at work? Uh, or maybe their brain is defending what little resources it has left so that it can use it later. This is why using facts and logic is not a very effective way of changing behavior. Uh, a logical argument requires a lot of processing power, and uh, so it's easier just to ignore the facts <laughs> and defend your brain's resources. The rest just get filtered out. 
there's some great research on the scale of the filtering our mind does. So as we sit here, about 40 million bits of information are bombarding our senses from all directions, but we're really only conscious of about 60 bits. The rest are being filtered. If necessary, they're being acted on through habits or reflexes, all subconsciously. So let's take a look at that another way. 0.00015% of the information is getting through to your conscious brain. Looking at it another way, if we made your prefrontal cortex the size of a bread box, the rest of your brain would be the size of the Milky Way. So what are the chances of your project being one of the 60 bits that makes it through the filter instead of one of the 40 million that gets stuck? Now when I talk about this, the thing that always seems to stick in people's minds is that they can only think for a few hours every day, but they get paid for eight. So I just want to stress that it's not that we aren't doing work for the other hours each day. It's just that we're running more on autopilot. So we're filing things, we're replying to routine emails, we're doing things that we can do more automatically. So I've talked about my top 10 myths, and I've explained how reluctant our brain is to spend uh, its very small amount of conscious energy and attention. So how do we get anything done? We perform tens of thousands of behaviors every day, from the tiny to the huge. So I think we can break up the drivers of our behavior into three general fields. Most of our behavior is determined by our physical context. If the road is straight, you drive fast. If the road is windy, you slow down. Light switches are all at the same height. We eat the food we can buy in the grocery store. We respond to our physical context, and we don't even question it. The next largest piece of behavior is determined by our social context. This sort of choice is less like thinking and it's more like catching a cold. Uh, if there's a lot of people sneezing around you, your chances of catching a cold go way, way up. Uh, if you work in the engineering department, your chances of wearing khaki pants and a blue shirt go way up. <laughs> if you work in marketing, your chances of wearing funky eyeglasses go up. So the social proof is that khaki pants are all around you and so you catch khaki pants. And then lastly, we have this puny little speck at the top of the pyramid here. This is the stuff we stop and think about. This is the stuff we analyze. And some estimates are that this controls between 5% and 0.001% of our behavior. Okay, so to help understand these different drivers of behavior, I'm just gonna throw a bunch of common strategies onto the respective areas. So education, documentary films, books, petitions, crowdfunding, pricing mechanisms, this is all up uh, in the conscious tip, the tiny little area. Things like fashion, music, sports, politics, religion, what brand of phone you use, uh, the culture we live in, this is all in our social context. Big system stuff like energy generations, vehicle efficiency standards, uh, building efficiency standards, building codes, huge amounts of the physical world we live in, the doorknobs, the chairs, lights, tables, switches. Uh, the countertops, sinks, taps, uh, this is all in the physical context, the system choice. Pension programs, set it and forget it, that's uh, in the system choice. Um, campaigns like Pink Shirt, uh, Pink Ribbon, and Movember, these are all asking for your attention. So they're up in the tiny little conscious area. There are some social aspects to them. They're greatly complicated by the fact that they don't actually do anything. So growing a mustache in November is not connected to curing cancer. It raises awareness, but awareness doesn't cure cancer. So there's uh, some challenges to those. <laughs> uh, public consultation, shower timers. Do you guys have these in Alberta? So uh, BC Hydro hands out these little egg timers that you suction cup to your shower wall, and the idea is, is that you're gonna turn on the hot water, get into this glorious cascade of hot water and then turn the egg timer over and three minutes later when it runs out, you're gonna get out. So obviously that's just an enormous demand on your willpower. <laughs> uh, whereas just changing the shower head to a low flow head uh, changes the system. And so you might be able to spend 20 minutes in the shower and still use less water than three minutes with your egg timer and uh, a higher flow shower head. Uh, advertising, lots of persuasive advertising is up in the tip and there is a bunch of social uh, advertising, that um, identity advertising that is uh, in the middle there. 
Speed limits, so the speed limit signs by the side of the highway are up in the tip. They're asking for your attention to tell you what to do. Uh, whereas, you know when you're driving down the road in a pack of cars, that's a social choice. So the, the social context that you're in is determining how fast you're driving. Uh, whereas some things like uh, small scooters, like you know the 49cc scooters that have speed limiters on them, they can only go 30 kilometers an hour or 50 kilometers an hour. So that is a physical change. The physical system is controlling your driving speed. So that's three different ways to control driving speed in these three different areas. Um, seat belts. So seat belts used to be an option that you had to pay for. <laughs> if you didn't want your kids to go flying through the windshield, you had to spend an extra 100 bucks on seat belts. Um, and that, of course, was bananas, and so seat belts became mandatory, and now all cars have to come with seat belts. But still, only about 80% of people are using the seat belts, and so they started adding airbags, and now airbags are mandatory. So the physical system has changed to make the, uh, the act of driving, the act of crashing, uh, safer. Uh, recycling, education, signage, prompts, feedback, these are all up in the tip. Uh, social norms and social proof of recycling are in the middle, social choice. Things like packaging regulations is a system change. So it just changes what is coming in that has to be dealt with. Uh, nutritional labeling. So you know on a can of food it has that little nutritional chart or if you, uh, if you go into like a fast food restaurant they're supposed to have the chart that you can request to say how many calories are in your uh, cheeseburger. That is all obviously very conscious and I think it's something like 0.02% of customers in fast food restaurants asked to see the nutritional labeling. Um, green labeling systems, corporate so social responsibility, this is all up in the tip. Um, feedback systems like uh, apps or Fitbits, this is all requiring your conscious attention. Social media, you know, so if you're on Facebook and you say, you should read this, you should uh, watch this film, you should blah, 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 that is all very attention demanding. Whereas social media can also be used as social proof, like I am in the gym, not not an article, you should go to the gym, but a photo like, whew, I'm at the gym working out. So that's two different ways of using social media consciously or socially. Um, petition sites like Avaz and Upworthy, those are all obviously very energy demanding, very attention demanding, whereas uh, street protests are social proof. So um, of course they can work both ways. If you have a giant street protest where 100,000 people go out, that's sending a signal of very strong social proof. If you have a lame street protest where only 10 people show up with signs, what they are proving socially is that that issue is in fact not worth caring about. Uh, so it's a real uh, double-edged sword <laughs> in that. Uh, so I just want to pause to appreciate how much we're trying to jam into this tiny little portion of our behavior you know, maybe zero, zero, one percent of our behavior. So that feels pretty overwhelming. So would you rather try to work in the crowded teeny little speck at the top or at the big wide base of the pyramid? So the reality of our life is that because of the physical limitations of our brain, we save energy by ignoring huge amounts of information. It's just filtered out. And the chances are the information you want people to see is going to be filtered out. We also save energy by following a social group and allowing them to make some of our choices. We save energy by building habits and using rules of thumb. We are very, very reluctant to spend energy to stop and think. And so most of all, we save energy by following the structure of the physical system. So that usually means when people are not behaving properly, they're in fact just following the system. This is a really critical insight from design thinking. If people are throwing recyclables in the garbage or throwing garbage in the recycling, it's because the system does not work. It's not their fault, it's your fault. It's manufacturer's fault. We've built the system backwards, so it works for machines and markets, not for human beings. So here's my message of compassion. Everybody knows that changing the system is very powerful, but it's also very difficult to change. It can feel impossible. We also have the classic fish and water problem where we're so used to the system we live in that we don't see them. We seldom consider where these systems came from, who designed them, or whether we have any other choices. And so when what we're doing doesn't work, we tend to do the same thing bigger, harder, and faster. And then we're surprised when it still doesn't work. 
changing the system is not only the most effective way to change behavior, because of our physical limits, it's often the only way. So we can build what I call compassionate systems when we design systems that are fundamentally loving of human beings. They, they respect our natural limits. By building compassionate systems, we can take the load off of us so that we can save our thinking for the things that we care about. So the question for us is how do we create change with a system that's accepted without question? How do we shape behavior in a way that's as obvious as which side of the road we drive on? Okay, so that's the big picture behavior change. Now I'm gonna take a few minutes to talk about the implications on garbage and recycling. I hope we can talk about this uh, over beers tonight. Um, and first I'm gonna talk about a few pet peeves. So these are ways we can increase the effectiveness of our current not very good system by making it work with our brains. So the first is timing. Governments often worry about overwhelming people and so change is uh, dribbled out over time. Like a new product is added to the recycling schedule every six months or a year. Um, I hope you can see now that this could not be a worse idea. <laughs> In fact, this approach is designed to make people fail. It would be um, much better to do a substantial change every two or three or five years that really uh, is noticeable as opposed to being a small change that is just filtered out. Another common problem is that every organization wants to have their own branded communications material. This results in uh, different icons and photos, layouts, text, colors that are all trying to communicate the same thing and we need to stop doing this. We're trying to build habits and automatic reactions and we need a standardized trigger for these habits. Uh, so while I was at Metro, we developed a full set of icons, photos, recycling signage, and a universal booklet. It was a language-free booklet, all icons, all of which is free to download and use. So this standardized icon set should be used across the province and would ideally be used across the country. Uh, I just want to talk about... <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I want to talk about photos for a minute because it really matters uh, when you use them. On the bin is the wrong time to use photos. Photos are extremely rich in information and so they're very likely to be ignored. They're filtered out because they overwhelm the user. So we've all watched this. Someone walks up to a waste storing station with an armload of garbage and they get kind of paralyzed and then they dump everything in the garbage can. Uh, so standing at the waste storing station, it's too late to do education. That education needed to happen months or years earlier so that when someone has garbage in their hands, they can just act, they can be, you know, they're just triggered by the color of the icon and they know what to do. Uh, so it was mentioned earlier that my colleague and I got a 250% increase in recycling at one of our test sites. So here's how we did it. We changed the physical context. It wasn't even a very exciting system change, but it turned out to be quite important. So at that time, Metro had a diversion goal of 70%. And then I'd go out to these sites and I would calculate how big the dumpster was and how often it was tipped and I would calculate how big the totes were in the recycling and food scrap streams. And what I found very consistently across dozens of sites is that 90% of the space was in the garbage dumpster and food scraps and recycling combined were only 10%. So can someone explain to me how you're gonna get 70% of the material in 10% of the space? So for our project, we shrunk dumpsters and we added recycling totes and they filled up the totes. So we added cardboard dumpsters and more recycling totes and they filled up those totes. And then we added food scraps and more recycling totes. We didn't need to do any communications. We didn't need to do any social norming. The residents just needed more infrastructure. They wanted to recycle, but our system was preventing them. Now, maybe it's the same here in, uh, in Alberta. In BC, if you went into a lot of ICI settings, there wasn't even a blue box. So I can tell you this, if there's no blue box, your recycling rate is gonna be very close to zero. How is it possible that a garbage hauler can drop off a dumpster, but isn't required to provide recycling and food scraps collection at the same time? In Vancouver ICI garbage, the top two streams are compostable, and the next four streams are blue box paper and yet we let haulers deliver only a dumpster, <laughs> and then we wag our fingers at people for not recycling. So those are a few of my pet peeves. 
about how our current recycling system is not designed for actual human behavior. We should be ashamed of wagging our fingers at people. They're doing the best they can in the system that we have built. If it isn't good enough, then we need to build a better system. Uh, in case I haven't been clear enough, I think our current system is very, very bad. Uh, it can't work. When we talk to individuals about individual changes they can make in their individual behavior, we create collective failure. So I spent this whole talk showing why voting with your dollar can't scale, why education or persuasion can't scale, and why the compassionate thing to do is to design waste out of existence. Uh, I use this photograph because I can't think of anything more hopeless than trying to deal with this pro problem than by making lampshades out of egg cartons. We must stop dealing with the end of the pipe. If we're forever reacting to whatever stupid products the marketing department dreams up, we will forever fail. We must go to the beginning and start dictating what materials are allowed in and how they're allowed to be used. Now, wouldn't extended producer responsibility help with that? <laughs> Tough crowd. <laughs> Uh, it hasn't in BC, so in many sectors it seems the costs are simply passed on to the consumer and there's no need for the manufacturer to change their product. So the producer helps pay for collection and recycling, which is great, but there's no change in consumption patterns. So in 2017, numbers in BC showed an increase in per capita waste generation. And we're not even talking about hard stuff here. So the largest fraction of garbage is still food and yard scraps. The next fraction is still blue box paper. The next one is probably wood. Like seriously, it's 2019, and we can't imagine that construction and demolition sites could separate their garbage, let alone deconstruct a building. How is it even legal to drop a free newspaper stuffed full of flyers on your doorstep without asking you if you want it? You should have to subscribe to that garbage. I can go to the mall right now and buy a printer that only prints on one side of the paper, and then we're mystified why there's so much paper waste. You can buy a plastic bottle of pop and use it once, or you can buy a glass bottle of beer that has a 97% return rate and can be refilled a couple of dozen times. I remember the local Coca-Cola bottling plant. This is not ancient history. These are system choices we made. If you want to talk about water bottles, the system solution is water fountains, not recycling. Draft beer is zero waste. <laughs> So these are small examples of our mindset and the way we've built the system. We charge duty at the border. Why don't we charge for the am amount of packaging being imported? We have food safety standards. Why don't we have recycle and repair standards? We have a building code. Why don't we have a product code? Thank you very much. Great presentation, Ruben. Um, I have experience with those angry children, so I can appreciate that. My four-year-old lies on the ground and refuses to put pants on, and my mantra is, his brain is developing. Be patient, his brain is developing. So I totally get it. So we're gonna open up the floor for a few questions for Ruben. Um, there are mics that are, I'm assuming somebody is tossing around. Maybe to get started, I have a quick question uh, regarding the project that uh, you did and saw 250% increase. So the worry for some of us who do programs like that is if you took, if you put the infrastructure in place, um, which is a great idea, what's the compliance? Like our worry would be that there would be a lot of contamination in those bins if you're taking away the waste. Did you experience any of that? No, the, uh, we only got down to about 30% uh, volume in garbage, so about 30% of our stream was dumpsters and 70% was, uh, was recycling and food scraps. Um, so not the ideal maybe 90, 90, 10 that we would like. Uh, so there was still tons of room in dumpsters. I never saw a dumpster full. And we were, I'm extremely proud of this data set. We went out twice a week with a bathroom scale and weighed the recycling totes for uh, three years. So. Uh, I think I have the finest data set in all of North America. And so I was looking in these dumpsters every single week and we never saw uh, a full dumpster. Jason has oh, okay. All right, I'm gonna hop it at you. I don't know if it's gonna get there. 
Nice. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm in. I've been in manufacturing, consumer goods, R and D for over 20 years, and you're 100% accurate. Um, I've developed things with companies all over the world, and and you're right. And I believe that. Um, so my question is, is and what I've found is, a lot of manufacturing is segmented, and that actually becomes a bigger problem, becomes harder. So because you have one person that does design, sourcing, PD, QA, um, there's that disconnect. And I think also with human beings, there's that disconnect because we don't do it with our hands. Mm -hmm. uh, education, so do you, would you support sort of a universal commercial education system that provides an insight to impact for uh, production creation and even in the schools? No, I um, uh, obviously I don't tend to speak carefully. Uh, <laughs> I uh, tend to say that education is what you do if you don't want to do anything. Um, there is so much, I guess another story. So I, uh, for a while I worked with the um, business services group and it turned out that no one in the business services group had ever owned or run a business. Uh, and so their idea of how business operated, I thought was totally out to lunch. So what I see business doing <laughs> is business uh, is flexible, creative, and responsive. So what government needs to do is set the standard, set the context, and then allow business to work. Um, instead, business, government tends to go in being very fearful and being like, oh, we can't hurt business. We can't disrupt business. Uh, and they end up doing nothing worthwhile and resorting to education campaigns and things like that. Um, we don't need to go out with proactive education. A lot of this stuff is extremely obvious and well known. What we need to do is set the demands, the baseline, the floor that everyone has to, has to pass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think we'd probably have to sit down with beer and pick some kind of mock products and start working through it a bit. Um, but as someone who's worked with, you know, someone who's worked as a designer and worked with designers, I, designers don't need to know all that detail. It's much better to just have the government say, no, no, we're only going to accept these plastics. Like imagine if we were only allowed to have products that had recyclable plastics instead of all the number sevens clogging up the world. <laughs> You know, so it's just set the standard, and then designers will be like, oh yeah, here's my standard. You know, this will all fit on one sheet of paper. I can use this plastic, I can use this kind of metal, I can use this kind of motor, blah de blah There's a question over here. All right. So in an area such as a school where kids aren't listening to the education system, what would be the most um, logical and rational for the human brain to help them recycle their things properly and not rebel against the system. In schools specifically? Why is there anything needing to be recycled in schools? Like, uh, like <laughs> compost wastes and hard plastics such as Tim Hortons ice cap cups uh -huh. because Lord knows that <laughs> kids drink a whole bunch of ice caps and yeah. won't listen to the reduce first yeah. rule of three hours. Uh, I love Tim Hortons. Um, <laughs> So imagine if you were, uh, I, I, I need a good metaphor here. Um, imagine if you were a farmer and um, you like, you know, someone came and they wanted to buy a basket of apples and you were like, oh, and by the way, here, I need you to take this garbage away and dispose of it for me. So you give them the basket and you give them a little bag of garbage that they have to go deal with. So that's what Tim Hortons does, is they have built a business model on everyone else paying for and managing their garbage, which I think is insane. The entire country is subsidizing Tim Hortons, which is bananas. Obviously, they should be applauded for their genius. But why, why is a plastic cup leaving Tim Hortons in order to enter a school? So it's... <laughs> 
congratulations to them. <laughs> um, so uh, it's, it's really easy for people like us who have spent our careers kind of fighting back against this tide of garbage to always kind of fall back to that like, ah, how do we, how do we, how do we solve this little, you know, ice cap cup problem? Uh, and I would encourage you to just throw the ice cap cup in the garbage and go smash a window on a Tim Hortons instead. <laughs> That's that <is> not endorsed <laughs> by RCA. <laughs> yeah. These are the opinions of the author alone. Uh, yeah, so, you know, don't do that. But that is, we need to be, we need to be pushing uphill, not always just trying to deal with this, this fire hose of garbage that's being blasted at us. So yeah, just uh, we need to be pushing uphill against, against a world that thinks it's okay to have plastic cups walk out the door of a business. Yeah, I, I think educate the kids on system change. So educate the systems on, kids on the effectiveness of, uh, of changing the, the world that we live in instead of trying to deal with any part of the, uh, the, the one million products that inundate us every day. So ask them to change the system and then um, give them a torch. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hi there. I think you can hear me. Yep. Um, so I'm going to characterize it as education because I've learned a few things today, but so you've just educated us. You've also said education doesn't work. Um, so that means that we have to start thinking about the systems that we create and making changes to those that have an impact, a sea change impact to recycling based on where we're at right now. Yeah. Is that a fair? Yeah. Okay. So given that, what's the, best thing that we can do, because there's people here from private sector, public sector, uh, various forms of the industry, consulting. What's the thing that we can do as a whole group? Because we're all a bunch of different fish heading in different directions. Mm -hmm. What's the thing that we can do as a group that can get us headed in the right direction to see some of the things that you think have to change in order for us to be able to see a sea change? Uh, okay, so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll try to string together uh, this story. So the first thing I think we need to do is to really dream of a world without garbage. So if you go to Starbucks and ask for an espresso, they'll give it to you in a tiny little paper cup. And if you went to Italy and asked for espresso in a tiny little paper cup, they would think you were an idiot. You know, so their whole culture around coffee is one of conviviality. So they've built a system, they've built a, a social context which is around the, the joys of sharing coffee with other human beings, not the mainlining caffeine in order to stay awake on your commute. So we need to dream of a world in which garbage doesn't exist. And then I think we need to look for Dave's. So I, I had this great opportunity to work with a guy uh, named Dave at the city of Vancouver, who was the guy who wrote the green building code for the city of Vancouver. Um, so there was literally one guy writing the green building code. Vancouver is, you know, a, obviously a very big economic center, tons of development going on there. So his work had huge impact. And then because Vancouver was so far advanced in this, the whole province of BC just adopted Dave's building code. So we could have gone the uh, David Suzuki or Greenpeace route, which is to try to megaphone every person in British Columbia about the benefits of green building and get them to write letters to their MLAs telling them that they should change the green building code. Or we can just go find Dave and start buying him beer. And then probably there's a couple more people uphill. There's Dave's boss, and there's maybe Dave's boss's boss, you know, that we need to also, like, shepherd in. But this is, that's the sort of thing we should be doing, is looking for one or two people that we can then say, okay, now I need your attention. 
I need to use your attention for this extremely important thing. If we do this via four million people, we're going to continue to fail repeatedly. If we can find the you know, small, extremely small pockets of influencers, then that has a hope. Yeah. Thank you. So sorry, I'm getting the uh, keep it rolling. So we're going to end the questions there for Ruben. That was a great presentation. I'm sure he'll be hanging around afterwards to keep asking. <laughs> So our uh, next presenter this morning is well known to many people in this room, Usman Valiante. Uh, Usman is a senior policy analyst and commercial strategist with 27 years of experience in the fields of environmental science and economics, corporate and commercial strategy, public policy development, regulatory and institutional design, advocacy, negotiation, consultation and communications. Usman has provided public policy to many federal and provincial governments, as well as CCME and FCM. He provides commercial strategy and regulatory compliance advice to a number of North America's leading manufacturing, consumer products, and environmental services companies. Usman is currently a director with BCMB, is an advisor to the Circular Economy Leadership Coalition, and was a convener of Ontario Circular Economy Innovation Lab. So he's here today to speak to those topics. Thanks. Thanks. I, I, I too am a British Columbian and I live on the traditional lands of the Skolmish at the top of uh, Howe Sound. Um, so um, I, I guess my presentation pivots off perfectly off of Rubens because I'm going to talk today about uh, systemic change and I'm going to talk about that in the context of plastics. Um, so a little bit of, of some background as to what I'm going to talk about. Um, the, that slide is a cover of a report that I prepared for the Smart Prosperity Institute that was sponsored by the Circular Economy Leaders Coalition um, on plastics. And the work I did uh, for this report, actually there was a longer report that was done for the Canadian Councils of Ministers of the Environment um, on barriers to a circular economy for plastics. And that work was informed by work that I've been doing for a number of consumer product companies and retailers on plastics and that work started actually previous before the Asian markets closed because these companies recognized that plastics were becoming uh, an untenable problem in, in, the, in the system and that they were going to be facing some serious issues in the long run uh, in the choices they were making on, on packaging design and on uh, end of life impacts as well as, as I'm going to talk about, um, with regards to greenhouse gas impact. So uh, this has been a long time coming. I've been, been at this for a while. And sort of the next uh, 18 minutes, I'm going to precy down uh, what, what uh, the pathway is to a circular economy for plastics and the types of systemic changes that we need to make, uh, harkening back to Ruben's presentation, to get us where we need to get to. Um, so um, I, I want to start with uh, putting plastics into context. So I've got a Sankey diagram up there. This was published this year. And on the left, it shows the inputs of fossil resources. So natural gas, liquids, oil, um, uh, light fractions of crude, et cetera, that go into the production of hydrocarbon-based petrochemicals. So if you go through, that's a mass balance. And on the right-hand side, you see a big, thick, blue band at the top, um, and that is fertilizers. So I want to talk, before I talk about plastics, I want to talk about fertilizers for a second, um, because fertilizers and plastics have a lot of things in common. First, they're made of hydrocarbons. Those fertilizers we use to grow food, and um, some of that fertilizer gets discharged. And in fact, that fertilizer is what has allowed us to increase agricultural productivity globally and is what's also driven population increases. And that fertilizer is actually what's in your food. So you actually eat fossil fuels. So um, that's one thing to think about is how we produce food. And then a significant portion of those fertilizers end up in the environment causing problems like nutrification of waterways and destruction of the ocean. Now, I live on the ocean, I'm a diver. I get to see what happens when, when there's agricultural runoff and I see plastics in the ocean. So um, the, the, the next two bands are plastics. 
So thermosets and elastomers, or, or, uh, or um, uh, thermoplastics and thermosets. So thermosets are things like tires, uh, so rubber, and, and thermoplastics are things like your PET bottles, HDPE, LDPE, et cetera. 40% of all the fossil uh, resources that go into petrochemicals go into plastics. And if you look at the greenhouse gas generation just associated with the production of plastics, it's 623 million metric tons of greenhouse gases a year to produce about 340, 330, 340 million metric tons of, of plastic. And of that plastic, um, so if I go to this slide here, that's a Canadian statistic. 9% uh, of the plastic in Canada is recycled. Um, that statistic is pretty well um, the statistic globally. So 91% of the plastics is lost as waste. All of the embedded hydrocarbons and all of the greenhouse gases used to produce those plastics are lost. And then we just go into another cycle of making more plastic. And that just goes on and on, and plastics increase is growing every year. So the petrochemical sector, or the, 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 the uh, primary extraction, the fossil fuel industry, uh, anticipates that all of the reductions in fossil fuel use uh, due to electrification of transportation is going to be displaced with increase in plastics. And meanwhile, we stagnate at a 9% recycling rate. So clearly, we've got a systemic problem and we need some kind of systemic solution. So, um, so, so what we call this, so folks are hearing the term circular economy, uh, 23, 24 years ago, uh, when I was a junior researcher, we called it industrial ecology, and I worked on industrial ecology projects. We now call it circular economy, but the concepts are the same. And the problem that we have is we're in a linear economy, which is, as I've described it for plastics, is the take, wake, take, waste, uh, take make, waste economy, which is we put fossil resources in to make products. Products are being produced because manufacturers are producing products to meet consumer demand. It is the manufacturer of a product or the manufacturer that uses a packaging, uses packaging that makes choices about what that packaging or product is made from. That then drives demand for resources. So in the case of where I'm using plastics for my packaging, that then sets off a chain reaction which is the extraction of natural gas liquids, the production of ethylene, the production of polyethylene from ethylene, and then the shipment of the ethylene to my packaging reformer that makes my, my plastic clamshell or bag or whatever it is that I'm using. Then I put my product in it, it goes out and it goes into the waste stream. And so it can either get landfilled or burned. And burning just converts plastics to greenhouse gases. You're just transferring, trans uh, furring the hydrocarbons from one medium to another um, with some marginal energy return, and then we start the cycle all over again. And each stage, when we move products, we produce uh, plastics, we're generating greenhouse gases. The entire system today is largely powered by fossil fuels. So that's the linear economy um, that we have today. And again, just the production is 630 million metric tons of greenhouse gases. When I burn that plastic, I triple that. So I immediately uh, uh, triple the greenhouse gases associated with it because it's, burning plastic is no different than burning gasoline. So here's some Canadian statistics. Um, these were done by Deloitte for the, for the CCME, or sorry, for Environment Canada um, earlier this year. We generate about 3.4 million metric tons of plastic waste from consumption of 4.7 million tons. The 4.7 million tons is both in packaging and durable goods. The 3.3 is comprised of durable and non-durable, what, what are being called single-use plastics, that end up requiring disposal. And so today, uh, the recycling rate is 9%, and the, and the remainder uh, is disposed of. So this is the Canadian profile, and, Canadi and Canada is a large producer of plastics. We, have, we are a petro-state, um, and we have a very significant petrochemical sector. That is uh, a, both a reality and an opportunity because some of the things I'm going to talk about to get to a circular economy for plastics, we have a head start on because we have a very sophistic, sophisticated petrochemical sector and everything I'm going to talk about is using plastics but using them in a new system. And that system, again, we have a head start because of the petrochemical sector that we have. So, um, oops, uh, wrong way, here we go. Um, 
So just defining the circular economy, lots of folks out there say there's lots of different definitions. That's actually not true. There's really only one definition of circular economy, and that's one where a product or package is either used, uh, it can be discharged into the environment and consumed by the environment with no harm. So it is a truly not just biodegradable uh, package or product, but it is food, a nutrient for biological systems. So today there's lots of things that we say are compostable, but they contain inks or dyes or additives which are actually bioaccumulate and are a toxin. So that, that's a very strict definition which says you can put it back and it can be consumed. So think of a tree losing its leaves in the fall. Those leaves, the forest doesn't have a waste management problem. Those leaves are, are nutrients for the next cycle of production. So that's, that's one, one system that, that we can aspire to. The other is it becomes a technical nutrient, which is it goes back into our industrial systems at high quality. So if we're, take, we're using aluminum, we bring that aluminum back in, it goes into the next cycle of production, and there's no waste associated with it. And today, most of our recycling activities have residuals associated with them because we don't design things for recycling, and so they're downgraded in the recycling process. Um, and so that, you know, again, we don't have truly closed loop technical systems today for a lot of materials. So a circular economy doesn't, is not recycling on steroids. A circular economy is a completely different system. Recycling is certainly a part of it, but if I walk through the life cycle of plastics, again, I have the producer demanding plastic for a product. However, now I'm making plastics using uh, artificial photosynthesis. So there is, where I live in Squamish, there's carbon engineering. Carbon engineering is sucking carbon dioxide out of the air using sunlight and using solar hydrogen. You can take that carbon dioxide and that hydrogen, you can start to make hydrocarbons. So you're going the other way. Instead of taking, putting CO2 into the air, you're taking CO2 out of the air, taking hydrogen from water, and you're making ethylene. So these chemistries are becoming uh, technically feasible and they're becoming economically feasible. Alberta has some of the lowest cost wind and solar power. It's under four cents a kilowatt hour here in, in Alberta, which makes it ideally suited to start producing these new chemistries. So now you've got plastics that rather than being carbon positive, that means they generate CO2, you're actually sucking CO2 to make plastic. And so you're reversing the system. You also can make plastics from waste biomass. And so now, now you're making plastics in a way where you're recirculating carbon. Think of it as carbon recycling. That goes into a system that now is designed, as Ruben talked about, to simplify the collection and recycling of plastics. And so that system now collects these plastics. Some of the plastics that are what we call hard to recycle today, you can gasify those plastics and make the next cycle of plastics. And so now we've got emerging recycling technologies, chemical recycling technologies for plastics, and these are all Canadian companies. I can list them off. Green Mantra, Pyrowave, Enerchem in Edmonton can make methanol from plastic. So, you know, there's Canadian technology emerging for the recycling of plastic, um, and that means recovering the hydrocarbons for the next cycle of production. If you start to power the system through renewable energy, you now go from carbon positive and, and you start to switch that system so it's actually sucking carbon in into the plastic, you're recirculating the plastic, you're now not generating any greenhouse gases and you're recirculating those hydrocarbons and you've now supplanted what you were taking from fossil resources and you're now using renewable plastic chemistries with new, with new recycling chemistries at the back end. So this is a com complete system transformation on how we make and use plastics. Um, and I can tell you the National Research Council, I'm working with the National Research Council to hold a seminar uh, for packaging designers and for resin makers um, on this. And it's, it's, yes, it's education, but it's getting the science out there and talking about the art of the possible. And this, this is not science fiction. This is happening today across Canada. These technologies are under development and they're at the cusp of being scalable and economic. So, Again, this, this slide just elaborates on some of the, I'm, I'm not gonna give an organics chemistry lesson here, but, but effectively these are the pathways for making the hydrocarbons we get from fossil resources today using CO2 and water and sunlight. So uh, electrocatalytic produ production, which are these catalysts that, are, that allow you to take CO2 
and produce these hydrocarbons and biomass. So the two pathways to keep in mind. And then again, I've talked about uh, chemical recycling. And so the, the, bottom, the bottom diagram is really shows how you can take solid waste, gasify it, reform it into what's called syngas, which is carbon monoxide and hydrogen, and then reform it into a number of uh, chemical products. So again, uh, the Enerchem process takes hydrocarbons from food waste and from plastics and paper, and then you can reform it into syngas, produce methanol, and methanol becomes a carrier to then produce ethylene, which then you're back to producing plastic. So, you know, there's still some challenges with these technologies. Uh, it's going to require systems to collect materials in a different way than we do today, so it can feed these systems. Um, so you're getting a relatively homogenous mix of hydrocarbons to go in here, which then speaks to how we collect things and how we prepare them for recycling. So again, it's systemic reform. Um, Way again. So, so this is really where we go from, okay, we understand where we want to go to, you know, that, that shining castle on the hill, um, but we're here right now and we need to get we need to get there somehow. So what are the barriers? So the first thing is, it, today it is very, very cheap to make plastics from fossil resources. Um, it is far cheaper than to do it from the renewable chemistries I've talked about. You, when you extract natural gas, you have fugitive methane emissions, you have all of these unpriced externalities as we call, uh, we call them, and we have huge scale efficiencies in fossil production. So an ethylene plant that's being fed by natural gas wells is a huge scale facility. It has huge efficiencies. So first of all, renewable chemistries and recycling has to compete with the super cheap plastic at the front end. And, and so then I've, I've already touched on the second part, which is these unpriced externalities. All the greenhouse gas emissions associated with producing plastics that today aren't addressed or priced. Um, that exchange of information between actors. So a lot of what I do, I'm a generalist. I know enough about chemistry and I know enough about economics and I know enough about things to know what I don't know. And I bring people together and we build teams and we try to solve problems. And so one of the things is getting the packaging using companies to think about these new chemistries and actually assess their feasibility and then go back and talk to their suppliers and start to have a dialogue. And that's emerging now. And there's a number of leading uh, Canadian consumer products companies and retailers that are starting to have that dialogue with the actual folks that are recycling materials and are looking to produce from renewable sources. So there needs to be these mavens that are a conduit between science and technology and the folks that are trying to put stuff into the market. Then there's the technological barriers. Those always exist, and I can tell you there's a lot of uh, really smart young people at, in academic institutions across Canada working on improving these catalysts, getting the chemical efficiency up, um, and, and making these technologies viable commercially, but they're going to need a kickstart, and that's what I'm going to talk about uh, next. And then existing policies and regulations that are a block to innovation. Um, some of our traditional recycling systems, if you look at the way we've done product stewardship in Ontario or Quebec uh, for a host of materials, they institutionalize bad practices. We need to rethink our public policies on uh, producer responsibility and, and what extended producer responsibility really means, and I'm going to talk about that in the next uh, three minutes, um, and then um, and then we can have a chat. So um, we talk about reduction, reuse, and recycling. So all those unpriced externalities, all of those those all that pollution, once you start to bring in policies in place that prohibit a free ride, that prohibit you from polluting uh, for free or producing things with, by generating waste, then what you do gets, if you, the wasteful activities become more expensive, and that's when you have an incentive to look at reduction, reuse, and recycling. Right now, there's very little incentive to look at those things because producing plastics is cheap and wasting it is very cheap. So three powerful levers in two minutes to, uh, to drive to a circular economy. So full producer responsibility. Full producer responsibility is not about transferring municipal costs to producers on a status quo system. Full producer responsibility is having producers build a reverse supply chain to consolidate materials and scale those systems to get materials processed in a way that, that allows for innovation. 
if you have um, you know, dozens and dozens of small 30,000 ton material recycling facilities, you don't have the scale to make the technological in, uh, uh, investments in sorting of plastics that get you the feedstock you need to put back into mechanical and chemical recycling. So you need scale, producers can bring scale, producers can actually span provincial borders. Um, the way I envision things, Western Canada should have one scaled system that's pulling materials from thousands, millions of Western Canadians to scale facilities that can get those plastics back into the next cycle of production. Stringency, there's no point doing EPR if you're gonna set 50% recycling target. Nobody here passed in school at 50%, 50% is bogus. Um, we should be shooting for zero waste. And yes, it's gonna cost a bit in the short term, but in the long run, those multi-laminate packages that are tough to recycle today, there are technical solutions, and when they're at scale, the unit cost is gonna come down for producers. Provide producers with economic freedom. So governments, when they regulate EPR, should regulate outcomes and performance objectives. We want this recycling target. We define recycling this way. We expect the market to sort it out. So the government should stay out of process and focus on measurement of outcomes and enforcement of those out outcomes to ensure that you get the innovation that you need to, to, uh, to fix this problem. Um, governments need to make policy and again, uh, and, and administer the law. So free riders are an issue and ensure compliance with accessibility and performance standards. It, EPR, regulating EPR actually is not that difficult. The simpler the EPR regulation, the better. Um, two other things, despite my time's up. Low carbon standards for plastics. Ruben mentioned standards and standards are critical. So a low carbon uh, standard for plastics would then set a bar that if you were to produce plastics, you need to meet the standard. And if you met that standard, you could do it through recycling or new renewable chemistries. And that would ensure that the guy that's producing recycled plastic has a market for it because folks would have to meet a standard for that carbon intensity for plastics. And then finally, pricing of greenhouse gases or mitigating them, low, you know, low carbon vehicle uh, standards, direct pricing of greenhouse gases, um, all of the things that we do to mitigate greenhouse gases are gonna improve the greenhouse gas profile of that overall life cycle. And elect, you know, electrification is the future. Hydrogen is gonna be a product of elect electrification and it, the, the only way we're gonna decarbonize the things that we produce, 45% of, of the greenhouse gases generated or in the stuff we produce is if we have mechanisms to decarbonize the system uh, along with changing how we make and use things. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Usman, that was uh, great. There's a few flashbacks to my university days in chemistry, which is why I switched to more softer sciences. Um, so do we have any questions for Usman? I think, uh, oh, up here, Jason. Oh. Did you want to come back up to the podium? Sure. Yeah. So, so not so much of a question, uh, more of a reference. There's a lot, whole lot of detail and information on those slides that you presented. Is there some way I can get a copy of your presentation? Uh, absolutely. I think Christina is going to make all of them available. Fantastic. And, and the report that that's a pricey of is also available on the Smart Prosperity website. I'll make sure you get a link of it. Okay. Hopefully. And yours too, Ruben? Thank you. Can you throw that to... Usman, you sit on my boss on my board, so you're my boss. You can tell me to shut up if you want. I'm not anyone's boss. <laughs> That's not me. <laughs> uh, so you you uh, you said let the set the standards, set the criteria for performance, leave the manufacturers free to design. Uh, there's a, a bit of a hiccup that I've heard coming back from some of that storyline that says other arms of the government are putting standards in place that prohibit or require certain. Uh, performance standards of packaging, uh, like food inspection agency, that kind of thing in Canada, uh, that limit the uh, the freedom that the manufacturers have, or limit the number of products that they can use as raw materials to produce their packages. Is there an element of your game plan that has to see some other, besides recycling and solid waste management elements of the government, stepping away from some of their standards in some way? Or how, how do you envision that as part of the solution? Well, I, I mean, I, I was talking uh, in the context of EPR, but if you have packaging food standards, um, you know, I, I, um, 
I appeared before a parliamentary committee on, on this plastics issue, and I was sitting beside Dow Chemical, and you know, the point that they made was, um, I, I produce polyethylene, and I don't care if the ethylene molecule comes from recycling or it comes from a natural gas well and is, is cracked into ethylene. So, you know, uh, chemical molecules are sort of neutral. Um, and so if we get to chemical recycling and you're using those hydrocarbons as a feedstock for packaging, the way the, ca the Canadian packaging standards are at the federal level, the safety standards are, is you meet a standard and it's kind of blind to what the feedstocks are. The issue today is with mechanical recycling is using mechanically recycled plastics in contact with food. And so some of these new recycling technologies will, will deal with that. But certainly if you can demonstrate you meet a performance standard, then government policy, policy should recognize that. So, you know, I, I think the packaging standards, if they are an impediment, will need to be addressed. But the way, the way I understand them today, we can make a lot of progress without having to go and deal with those standards right now because the, the recycling processes we're talking about re yield the chemicals that we need to make the next cycle of plastics. So um, you've been successful at helping governments move forward. You're, you're really good at helping tell stories and, and helping governments understand opportunities. And this week, our premier said, and I quote, um, he's talking about single use bag bans, and he said that that would be contrary to Alberta's interest. The province is exploring ways to attract investment into the pet petrochemical industry. Uh, so what would you say, what would you say to Premier Kenny? when he's thinking about extended producer responsibility or plastic bag bans or product standards? How would you start to have the conversation to change his mind? So I think plastic bag bans are, are um, a separate issue. So plastic bag bans in you know, coastal environments like where, where I live in Skomish, um, you know, our, our mayors decided to bring in a bag levy. And I like bag levies because it dramatically reduces the amount of plastic use. When someone pays for a plastic bag, they're unlikely to dump it in the ocean. So it gets, it gets reused for something. Um, so that, that, that's one issue. The, the petrochemical discussion is a very interesting one because Alberta has so much uh, intellectual capacity in the hydrocarbon sector. And so the chemistries I'm talking about are the same chemical engineers that work on turning natural gas to plastics could be working on turning carbon dioxide to plastics. And so that's the head start I'm talking about. And it's basically governments, um, a lot of what we have today, you know, I'm, I'm a small C conservative and I, I believe in a limited role of government, but governments have a powerful role in shaping markets, right? They set rules. And so governments also set, set the economy down certain tr technological pathways. And, and a lot of the technologies that we have today in your cell phone were started in government labs that were then commercialized. And so the government, the Canadian government and the provincial governments can kickstart this low carbon economy and give us a head start. And so I think our petrochemical industry is not a liability, it's a strength that we can bring to deal with this. And you know, I think if you look at carbon engineering in Squamish, its first venture is down in Texas, taking carbon dioxide and using it as a diluent for low carbon fracking. Now, it's not the best practice, but it's one that allows it to scale up. You could take that same carbon dioxide and make chemical products from it. So I think there's an opportunity here. It's just a matter, I think, of government's understanding that there's different technological pathways and trajectories they can set the economy on. And this is a discussion we need to have. Thank you, Usman, and I'm sure he'll hang around if there's any questions uh, that come to mind afterwards. So our uh, last presenter this morning is joining us uh, on Skype, I believe from Ontario, very conscious of her carbon footprint. Um, so it's Dr. Diane Sachs. She is one of Canada's most respected environmental lawyers with over 40 years unparalleled experience writing, interpreting, and litigating Ontario's energy and environmental laws. And she is the former Environmental Commissioner of Ontario. Diane is an experienced team leader with substantial board experience and a skilled communicator with broad strategic vision. She has exper expertise in government relations, corporate governance, and public consultation. She is a can-do person, always striving to make a difference. 
So Diane now heads up uh, Sachs Facts, which is a business providing strategic advice and presentations on climate, energy, and environment. And she's here to provide some Ontario context on circular economy and climate change. So there she is. Welcome, Diane. Hello, everybody. Um, Dusty, are we good? Yep. All right, well, anyway, it's very nice to talk to you all today. I can't see anybody except Dusty, but hopefully there's somebody there. Um, it's, I'm sorry not to be in beautiful Jasper with you. It would have been lovely, but I am trying to reduce my flying, um, even though I'd love to be there. So I was asked to talk about the report I did as Environmental Commissioner of Ontario when Ontario adopted its Waste Free Ontario Act. And so we looked at Ontario's waste problem, the Waste Free Ontario Act, which was, uh, I think, the only major new environmental statute uh, brought in by the previous government that we still have in Ontario, and a little bit about the circular economy. Uh, no surprise, Ontario has a very big waste problem. Uh, we, we're, we're world champions of waste, and we throw almost all of it out. Um, so here are some stats. Again, these are a couple of years old. Uh, Ontario produces about 12 million tons of waste a year. That's almost a ton per person a year, and three quarters of it goes to landfill, um, whether in Ontario or in the United States, and about 300,000 tons are incinerated. Um, the consequences, you all know, so, and groundwater pollution, the methane, which is a significant climate pollutant, um, and one of my hobby horses has been how much we underestimate the climate damage of methane because in the conventional accounting, it's usually reported as being 25 or so times worse than carbon dioxide. Well, actually, while it's in the atmosphere, it's probably more like 100 times worse, as well as uh, contributing to ground level ozone, which is itself a climate pollutant as well as a human health hazard. And it squanders resources. So lots and lots of problems with putting um, putting so much waste in lentil, especially organics. So we looked at the history of the Blue Box. The Blue Box began as a voluntary program in Ontario, the world, the world birthplace of the Blue Box. And it was mandatory for most larger municipalities uh, from 1994. And yet we always, always struggled. We always struggled with funding. We always struggled with markets. So the Waste Diversion Act was adopted in 2002 to um, provide a, some financial basis for some financial support for municipalities for the blue box and added household hazardous waste in tires and electronics. And at that time, there was a widespread and completely unjustified belief that the blue box would become financially self-supporting within five years, that once the system was up and running, the costs would come down and the markets would pay so much for the materials that the whole system would pay for itself. And I, I, I hope it's no surprise to all of you that that is not what happened in any respect whatsoever. Now, there were a lot of problems with the Waste Diversion Act, and so a significant part of our report was looking at what didn't work about that statute. Um, the short answer is that it's very expensive for municipal taxpayers, and waste diversion really stagnated. Um, that was partly because lots of things weren't covered, and even the things that were covered, there were, there were many problems. So we, we looked at, you know, the overall design was deeply flawed. As I say, it began with this theory that if we could make everyone keep recycling, that it was going to become cost-effective and economic, and it was all going to be lovely. Um, and we had this theory about reduce, reuse, and recycle, and according to the theory, we were going to recycle only what we needed to, and first we were going to reduce and reuse. And it's not telling tales out of school to say that basically Ontario did almost nothing effective about reduce and reuse. The, the main reduction thing that was championed was that packages got thinner. Now that actually makes them quite a bit harder to recycle, as you know. One of the stats to illustrate that is that uh, when the Waste Diversion Act was first being developed, the expectation was that you could get a ton of reusable plastic by collecting 35,000 water bottles. But once the water bottles were made thinner, now you have to collect 70,000 water bottles and take off 
the lids and the labels and so on and so on and so forth to get a ton of plastic. Um, so we've had entirely the wrong emphasis. We have put so much faith in recycling. It's actually amazing how much people in Ontario believe recycling is all they have to do. Many people think it's perfectly okay for them to drive a big SUV, fly all they want, um, eat beef, as long as they throw something in the blue box, whether it belongs there or not. So we've had this quasi-religious belief in recycling, which is just not justified by the facts. So we had this new Waste Free Ontario Act um, passed in 2016, and this was an enormous triumph. There had been more than eight years of effort to lead to that point. And so there was a moment of optimism that, okay, here's a new waste law. What is it going to change? Um, and there was a lot of optimism for a few minutes. And it actually contained uh, two parts. There was called the Waste Diversion Transition Act, which was to manage the continuing programs like the Blue Box, which were already running to some extent under the Old Waste Diversion Act, and this new statute called the Resource Recovery and Circular Economy Act. So here's some of the things that were new in the act and in the strategy that went in it. And the key thing that got a lot of attention was um, a more direct producer responsibility system for individual producers, as opposed to everything going into the blue box of Stewardship Ontario. So the idea was it's going to be enhanced transparency and so on, and it was going to lead us to the circular economy which uh, you just heard has been talking about, and that's, you know, in some ways the holy grail, but it didn't take us very far. Anyway, here are three of the key issues that we looked at, is can this new statute work? Um, the three key things we focused on were organics and landfill, how weak our recycling standards are, and this huge and ongoing problem of industrial, commercial, and institutional waste. So organic waste, um, about a quarter, a little over a quarter of waste is organics, uh, meaning basically organics uh, that rot and produce methane in landfill as well as leachate and other things. It has a very poor diversion rate. It is a major source of climate damage. It's also the major source of leachate, so damaging groundwater. And it is an enormously wasted resource. We desperately need what is called renewable natural gas, some way of displacing natural gas for heating. And we could theoretically be capturing the methane from all these organics, but mostly we don't. Um, as I mentioned already, uh, methane is about 100 times worse than climate pollution uh, and than CO2 because it doesn't stay in the atmosphere very long. And the conventional numbers are based on assuming that it's the average over 100 years. We don't have a hundred years. The climate crisis is moving much faster than that. So uh, we, we showed if you valued uh, methane, even at its 20 year average numbers, waste has a much bigger footprint as part of our overall emissions. Um, it, it's also a health hazard at high concentration. So it's a huge waste. Um, so we shouldn't be putting organics into landfill. But the, the first thing is we can't ban organics from landfill unless you have somewhere to send them. And we have had an enormous problem in Ontario providing approvals for sites that organics can go to, whether anaerobic digestion sites or composting sites. Uh, lots of these sites have been prosecuted. There'd be huge problems with odor and intolerance for odor um, and ministry intolerance for any kind of operational problems as well as the cost of the approval process. So we don't have, uh, I was told we had maybe half of the composting and anaerobic digestion facilities uh, in Ontario approved that we would need if we actually ban organics from landfill. So we need to do both. We have to have a ban on organics, but we also have to have a place for them to go. Uh, and there is, of course, a financial issue. It is still cheaper, it looks cheaper to throw things out, especially when you throw in the US, because if you don't, if you consider the pollution to be free, although it really isn't, then it looks cheaper to throw it out. So that's another problem, another reason we need a carbon price. Uh, and by the way, the federal 
carbon price, which we now have in Ontario under the Canadian framework, doesn't put a price on methane emissions in those sites. So it's not solving this problem. So we made some recommendations um, on how to deal with that. And of course, there's lots of places to learn from, including Nova Scotia, which has had a ban on organics and landfill for 20 years, doesn't keep everything out, but, um, but it keeps a lot out and can be improved. Second big issue that we looked at is we claim to recycle lots of things, but actually the standards are often not very good. And if we're going to have a level playing field, we have to have real tight, high enforced recycling standards. Um, and that we've had lots and lots of problems with. So clarity and enforceability are a huge issue. Um, unwillingness of the government to impose expense on business of genuine targets. And we saw this example, particularly with batteries. And as well, if you get too prescriptive about the standards and you don't allow for innovation, and we need innovation to reduce the cost and to create the kind of world that Isman was talking about. So we made some recommendations about recycling standards, and we know there is an enormous need for much better recycling standards so that you don't just burn something in a uh, smelter, spit it out the other end, call it aggregate, and then dump it. Uh, the third big issue that we saw is that the ICI sectors absolutely don't hold their weight. Uh, and you can see that they have very low diversion rates, uh, much lower than individual homes where it's much more expensive to collect things. They're big waste generators and generally they've been able to get away with doing the cheapest thing, which has been usually to send it to dumps in the US. So you can see the stats, they've been exempt from the blue box. Um, and an awful lot of that has simply gone into landfill. The idea again was that paper and packaging would be used as a raw material, but we have lost some of our paper recycling facilities, partly because of environmental regulation and um, a will an unwillingness to accept some local impacts for the greater public good. We just haven't seen that. So lots and lots of challenges with how we're going to do that. Um, people are used to the cheap, easy, just throw it away in the US. And of course, we've also lost, uh, since we wrote this paper, there is the China sword. So again, a lot of systems customers got used to doing something cheap. And it was, in many cases, very cheap to just ship stuff across the ocean to Asian countries that, as you all know, don't accept it anymore. Um, so we say it's time to stop letting the ICI off the hook. There, we have source separation regulations in Ontario. We've had them since 1994. And I think it's fair to say they have been almost never enforced. So that's almost worse than nothing. Having laws that are on the books, but that nobody enforces simply breeds a contempt for the law and did not lead to, as you can see, a reasonable level of diversion, much less any kind of realistic reduce or reuse. Um, there was a bit, a, a bit of a challenge to this some years ago, about 2006, the Minister of Environment said to Stewardship Ontario, uh, well, what are you actually doing to build this system so you get some reduce and reuse, not just recycling? And the answer was basically, I'm being slightly unfair here, but not too far from nothing. So those are big problems we have with the system that we have now. What about this idea in the statute that we're going to have a circular economy? We've already heard from Usman a lot about that, and we know we have to go there. Um, Vaclav Smil puts it uh, fairly clearly, I think, by saying that never in human history have so much money and resources been devoted to producing, rapidly producing junk for a very ephemeral, in many cases, immeasurable amount of human benefit. We extract enormous number of resources that the world cannot afford to continue to spend. We produce and distribute and consume and very rapidly we've created waste. Um, and we know that in a secular economy, you cannot have that. It has to be more like a natural system where nothing is created that something else doesn't eat and reuse. 
Uh, and that has to start with just having less stuff. Um, again, you've heard from this one a lot of the reasons why. I, I, I hope I don't need to say why. Definitely from a climate purpose as well, reducing the amount of stuff we create and throw out is part of the story. It's not one of the biggest parts of the story. A very last thing I did before my office was abolished in March was publish a analysis of the carbon footprint of individual Ontarians. And in Ontario, the largest direct carbon footprint is from individuals, it's not from heavy industry. And one half of the carbon footprint of individuals comes from four things. Driving, and we Canadians drive the most inefficient, most climate polluting vehicles in the entire world. We've beaten out the United States. Heating leaky houses, we have very leaky homes as a rule. Flying and eating beef, four come from that. And so the CO2 that's embodied in goods and materials, it's important, but it's not, it's not as significant as the big four. Nevertheless, it has a big climate footprint, it has a big environmental footprint, it has a big water footprint, it has a huge waste footprint, and there is huge economic and employment promise to using things over and over again instead of devoting our money and effort and resources to creating junk. But it is an enormous challenge, and passing a law that has the word circular economy in the title is only the first step on a very long road and procurement support is enormous, uh, going to be a massive, a massive challenge. And we've seen almost no steps towards actually implementing it since then, but we shouldn't lose the concept because we, we need it. The bottom line I think is to look at, well, focusing on recycling doesn't work. And just telling people to, I don't know, buy solid shampoo that doesn't come in packaging doesn't work either. We shouldn't, as a society, have a system where it is okay to create waste that has no end use. And so that I, that's my final recommendation, is that government and business has to work together to create profitable markets for all end of use, end of life materials. But if there isn't a profitable market for a material, it is not okay to use them. It is not okay for businesses to put their needs first, to allow waste to be created, and then to say, all right, someone else has to take the responsibility for picking that stuff off this, up off the street, of pulling it out of, of waste bins or recycling bins and finding something to do with it. It is not socially responsible to create especially plastic waste. And that is a completely different mindset, but it's not that new. I mean, 100 years ago, there was very little waste created. There is nothing that tells us that we need to have a society where it is okay to create trash. And we know there's a lot of reasons why we need to stop. We can look from others, um, the Scottish, um, have done a really good job. Now, admittedly, they've been able to draw on some of their own natural stereotypes about thrift and about making things last, uh, buying less, using it better, repairing things, and they've been able to develop uh, a whole new set of industries on how do you, for example, remanufacture medical equipment so that it can be reused. And we see that same lesson being pursued in other places. Uh, Scotland has given itself the formal target of a zero waste society. Uh, Vancouver, of course, has, has got some of that direction as well, with some real targets moving quickly, um, still looking a lot at recycling, but finally recognizing landfill is the wrong solution. Landfill is a bad solution. Landfill, landfill is creating pollution that will be with our children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren for a very long period of time while taking the resources that they are going to need. So we could do that too. Um, fundamentally, no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. And this is part of the answer. Getting rid of waste, not creating materials that we can't productively reuse. That's part of our climate transition and there's nothing more urgent. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Um, 
So one thing I forgot as moderator to ask is how does the questions work with Diane? Can she hear us? Yeah? Uh, yes, yes, I'm about to find out. Perfect. So um, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Sachs? Sorry, the microphones are just going out. Yeah, I've got this side. Um, well, mine's pretty broad, I guess. I, I could uh, throw one at you. Jody kind of asked a similar question earlier, but um, Dr. Sachs, Alberta is um, just starting to kind of navigate these waters. Um, so I guess I would ask maybe what advice you would have for us as we are trying to um, push this upwards to our provincial government to, to have a, be a better focus on creating some sort of regulation for us? Well, it does, li like any other com political action, it always comes from a multiple group of sources. Usually you need people who want it because of the benefits and you need a problem to drive it. In Ontario, the problem has been lack of landfill space and difficulty getting new landfills approved and the pollution that landfills create. Uh, and I, forgive me, I don't know enough about what the situation is in Alberta. Um, it definitely helps when they hear from innovators. We have, we have answers, we can help make things better. Um, and they have to hear at the same time about the problems. And sometimes those problems are litter, which is really visible. Um, a lot of people who may not care about the larger issues may not like litter and plastic is a particularly difficult kind of litter. So I would say look for, a, you know, and I don't really have anything new to say about this. Do you have a coalition you can build that can give someone good reasons? And if you don't have it at the provincial level, do you have it at the municipal level? I mean, Edmonton is a remarkable city that's a leader in many ways. Maybe they're a good place to try things out. What I find with municipalities is there's a lot more variability in municipalities. There's a lot more innovation percent potential in, uh, at the municipal level and lots of municipalities like to be second. They want to see someone else do it first and see how it worked and if it worked there, then maybe they'll prepare to try it. A second thing that I would really suggest is look at and build on the Municipal Climate Emergency Declarations, which have been spreading across Canada. I mean, of the 990 odd municipal, I'm oh, sorry, climate emergency declarations around the world, almost half of them are in Canada. And so municipalities that have adopted such a declaration, they need to find a way to take action. And waste and litter cost them a lot of money. So you might be able to get some attention there. Great, thank you. I do think we have another question in, over here. Um, how do you suggest that we make it not okay to create waste as a society for other people and to change people's mindsets from seeing the cheaper option of throwing things in the landfill to a more positive option of reducing and reusing? Well, there, I mean, again, there's nothing really new about this. One key thing is to look past the science. I mean, my, my livelihood has always been in writing really good, well-analyzed factual things. And that provides a floor, but it doesn't reach people's hearts and minds. I think art can do a lot. So um, Roberta Bondar did a great project, some, uh, which I think st she's still doing, of lending cameras to young people and giving them an assignment of taking pictures with no waste in them. And she found that this made young people aware for the first time of how much waste there is in their surroundings, and they didn't like it. They, they recognized how much more beautiful it is without waste. So finding ways to use the arts to envisage what this is like, I think is important. And another really great thing is the power of young people to set fashion. What gives people status? What's cool? Is it cool to have, I don't know, a plastic bag or is it disgusting? So in the same way that cigarettes went from cool to disgusting, um, partly because of what's fashionable, going to leaders of what's cool, what's popular, what gives you status, those are really great folks to support. And um, a lot of them are interested in having a role. We, there's a group now called Artists for Real Climate Action. Maybe they could help. Great, thanks. Christina. 
You don't often ask questions. Go for it. <laughs> Hi, Diane. It's Christina Seidel. Um, I want to ask you a question about your previous role as Environment Commissioner, because I thought that was such an amazing role to have in government. And I was, I sad, I was sad to hear that no longer, long, no longer exists in Ontario, but I wonder if you can comment how, how important you think it is to have that role, and is that a role that you would like to see all provinces establish? Well, absolutely. One of the things that has dramatically changed since I was young is public faith in government. Um, when I was young, it was the law that what the attorney general said was the public interest, and the people generally accepted that what the government said was the public interest. We've had a catastrophic decline in deference since then, and we've also seen a catastrophic decline in politicians' trust in the civil service and the ability of the civil service to give nonpartisan science-based advice that governments accept. And so we do need, and there's an appetite for a nonpartisan independent source who's got nothing personal to gain, who can document the facts and evaluate policy. Um, and, and I found that there was tremendous appetite for the work of our office, the 17 reports that I put out. But it doesn't happen by itself. It also has to be coupled with really active outreach to the public. People are often struggling to understand these issues are complicated and scary. Um, and so, yes, I think that as an independent environmental commissioner who was able to put the environment first, not money first, I was able to give the public a way to understand issues that they didn't have any other way, as well as a champion for the Environmental Bill of Rights. So we've, we've lost a lot. Um, and yes, I, I, I hope to see other, other provinces find a useful way to create such a role. My only direct equivalent in the world was Simon Upton in New Zealand, and he is, he's really treasured there by not only the public and the media, but also by the government ministries, that he's able to do some things that they can't do because he doesn't have to do things just because they're popular. He can look at what's the best policy, and that's, that's a great freedom. Great, thank you for that response. And thank you for joining us this morning, all the way from Ontario. Thank you, and I hope you all get a hike for me. I wish I were there. Bye-bye. <laughs> Great. Um, so I think that wraps up our session this morning. I want to thank our other two presenters that were here with us this morning. That was a great way to kick off the day. Um, and I do have gifts for you guys uh, to keep in theme with the conference. So thanks, and I think it's break time. <laughs>